The research is devoted to deepening knowledge about two issues. Firstly, it is an attempt to analyze the interpretation of the existence of non-canonical motifs in the poetry of Hanshan, Suda and Fengan, collectively known as Hanshan Su. Secondly, it provides an analysis of the reception of such motifs in this poetry. Firstly, Hanshan Su, as it was already said, refers to the poetry of Hanshan, Suda and Fengan. Their historicity has not been determined yet, but according to some autobiographical poems and literary tradition, Hanshan was an ermit living in a mountainous seclusion, whereas Suda and Fengan were more or less re related to Guoqin Monastery located at Tiantai Mountain. Their poems, although regarded as deeply Buddhist, contain some motifs which could be classified as either problematic, transgressive or secular from a broader orthodox perspe perspective, such as poems engaging in secular literary discourse, hedonistic poems, poems about women, and poems with either Taoist or Confucian motifs. Although these words should be taken with some degree of caution, as it is obviously very hard to clearly define what constitutes the orthodoxy and the normativeness. So my point is absolutely not to define what is and what is not Buddhist, but to rather analyze how some themes were interpreted by actors of discourses. There are three main theories regarding the dating of this poetry. One of them is based on the linguistic research of Pulleblanc. Through rhyme analysis, he concluded that about two-thirds of the poems in Hanson Su was composed in the early 7th century or even earlier, while the rest was most likely composed by someone completely different and that it could happen in the 9th century. And this is a good starting point to talk uh, about the historical and literary background of this poetry. Thomas J. Mazanek divides the history of medieval Buddhist monk poetry into four periods. First, high and mid tongue. During this period, the activities and origins of the monks were primarily concentrated in the eastern Jiangnan region, particularly the area of present-day Suzhou and Hangzhou. That is also the period when the first monk, who earned the nickname Suseng, literary poet monk, that is Lingyi, lived, although the name Suseng at the time primarily referred to a group of poet monks centered around Jiaoran. Late Tang. The third decade of the 9th century brought a change. The center of gravity of the discourse of Buddhist poetry partially moved towards the capital, and with it the term Shuseng also moved there, adopted by some and rejected by authors. However, the term Shuseng took, took on a new value laden and, and negative meaning. It referred to the dichotomy of, developed earlier by Bai Jui, which divided uh, monk poetry into two types. The first one was real sublime poetry, the other one was an inter intermediate form between poetry and didactic Buddhist verses, therefore needing the term shuseng, or rather sengsu, monk poetry in this case, which uh, also distinguished it from real poetry. He believed that uh, poetry should not be treated as a um, goal in itself, but it, sh it should rather work in a framework of upaya as a didactic means leading to the ultimate soteriological goal. The th third period, uh, the main characteristic of the third period uh, was the deurbanization of the activity of the poet monks. They moved to places far from urban centers. At that time, a sudden increase of the popularity of the sacred mountains can be observed. It was during that this period that uh, Chan Buddhism began to gain increasing popularity in the mountainous region of Jiangnan. The fourth period, according to Mazanek, became a renaissance of Buddhist poetic traditions, which found refuge in the course of many regional rulers. Although Buddhist poets of this period were not necessarily ousted from their literary annals, their rep reputation in the, in the eyes of non-Buddhists gradually deteriora deteriorated over time. On the other hand, poetry opposing Buddhists did not consider poet monks to be Buddhist enough. The change of the perception of this uh, phenomenon was to take place by the end of the 11th century. This is also linked to a shift of the center of gravity of poet monks' act activity, which took place primarily during the third period. It is important because, firstly, the change of gravity towards mountain mountainous seclusion in Jiangnan, in order to escape the uncertainty of the world of the time, was also represented by Han Sansu.
There are many poems which either praise the secluded cold mountain or complain about aforementioned uncertainty of the world and organized monasticism, as visible in Hansan 181, uh, seven, uh, 276 and uh, 286. Secondly, mountains played a vital role of a melting pot for many re religious traditions, a space for Buddhists and Taoists, among others, to perform mutual and interchangeable religious acqu acqu acquisition. That might be one of the reasons for frequent occurrence of Taoist motifs in Han Shan Si. So, how does Han Shan Si fit within this phenomena? Many of the characteristics and motifs appearing in their poems would point to, the, to a time of creation from the third or even fourth period. On the one hand, Hansan, Sud and, and Fengen actively participated in the debate on Sangsu, the possibility of reconciling poetry with Buddhism and the position of the poet monk compared to the non-Buddhist poets. Such a position would have been fundamentally impossible to take during the first and second periods. This is because the discourse at the time was not diversified enough and not advanced to that extent. The repeated theme of escaping to the mountains uh, of the south from the hustle of the temporal world could also point to the third period, where the mountains became a frequent place of, es of escape for poet monks. Perhaps the turmoil of the temporal world and the social friction depicted in Hanson Su refer to the unrest of the time. However, this point should be treated only as a very loose hypothesis. On the one hand, the motive of uh, the mountain as a place of solitary confinement already existed to a greater or, or lesser extent. On the other hand, however, um, Hanson Su does not give specific names of phenomena. He does not mention the Huang Chao rebellion, nor does he accurately describe the social frictions he mentions. The second issue is the Chinization, although the term itself should not be taken literally, of the sacred mountains of Jiangnan, which uh, began to take place on a wider scale only in this, uh, in this third period. The spiritual provenance of Han Shan Shi points to Chan Buddhism, whereas Tian Tai Buddhism, associated with the poet's place of residence, is not part uh, of this figure's identity. While easily overlooked, Han Shan's use of the word Su is telling, as there has been a centuries long debate of the terminological framework of Su and Ji Song in Buddhist literature and its boundary with China's non Buddhist literary traditions. Many monks preferred to refer to their work by the more Buddhist term Jisong to avoid Su, which sometimes was perceived as an overly secular term. This issue um, of the ex exact differences between Su and Jisong are both contentious and conventional as well as highly complex. Mm, however, according to the research of Jason Protas, it could be a long story short summarized that Gata was Sanskrit poetry, Jisong, which partially is a translation of the term Gata, was Buddhist poetry, originally composed already in Chinese, whereas Shu, or Buddhist Shu, was Buddhist poetry indeed, but it, it stressed the importance of poetry itself over its potentially didactic register. He also states that so called Suification of Jisong, that is, poetization of Buddhist poems, was completed by the early Song dynasty. Han Shan Su takes an um, unequivocal stance of, uh, on complementarity of poetry and Buddhism. Not only are there poems equating sutras with poems of Han Shan, but also many poems, such as uh, 305, which took a very, very clear position on some issues of uh, non-Buddhist literary discourse. As for the reception of Han Shan Su, the reception within the non-Buddhist Chinese discourse is very short. Hansen Su is mentioned in, in Siku Chuen Su, um, and there were few other mentions, but all in all, it was not an influential body of text. On the other hand, on the ground of Buddhist Chinese discourse, Hansen Su was a relatively popular subject of imitation in the Song Dynasty, of figures uh, such as Fading Tai Ching and Fading Sang Zhao, among many others. It was also mentioned in Song Gaz and Zhuang. However, it still did not play a significant role as in Japan where it became an inspiration for many writers, such as Gozan Bungaku, the literature of five mountains, and painters, such as Sengai Gibbon, Ito Yakuchi, among others. It has also got as many as four commentaries, in which there was a commentary by Hakuin Ekaku, which turned out to be a work of a, of a great influence on shaping the understanding of Hansan Su.
because Han Sanshi came to the Western world from Japan, is it was also perceived there through the kind of prism of um, Buddhistness, perceived as a representative uh, example of Chan Buddhism philosophy, filled with very deep spiritual meaning, and it was especially uh, important within the Bitniks culture. As for Hakuin Ekaku's commentary, it has been perceived as a commentary enumerating and ex explaining Buddhist motives. And while Buddhism plays a very important role in his commentary, is it really so? His commentary on every poem is divided on, in a do doctrinal um, commentary, where he explains doctrinal philosophical layer of a poem, and literary commentary, where he is scrupulously, scrupulously enumerating literary intertextuality. However, some poems, such as 131, regarding worldly affairs, such as, for example, the motive of women, does not have doctrinal commentary. In their Hakuin only mentions literary references to some works of classical Chinese literature. Why is that? There are several possible explanations. Firstly, Hakuin Akaku might be a connoisseur of poetry as such, given his literary past when uh, he decided to hold on his monastic career and engage in uh, literary practice. And secondly, his turbulent uh, spirit, spiritual path with, with so-called Zen sickness and numerous moments of doubts could lead to um, could lead to a more liberal attitude towards unconventional means of attaining the Enlightenment. He might perceive poetry as, as a Waishu, so-called external doctrine uh, that is not necessarily conventional means of practice, but nevertheless is a practice ultimately leading to attaining the spiritual goal. Moreover, he argues that the ultimate meaning of not only all Buddhist schools is the same, but also non-Buddhist teachings, such, such, such as Taoism and Confucianism, is also the same. When it comes to reasons for the differences in the reception in Japan and China, one cannot underestimate the aforementioned influence of Hakuin Ekaku. However, it is also because Chinese discourse perceived poetry as incompatible with Buddhism. Firstly, it was said that um, the goal of poetry is to express emotions, and Buddhism suppresses these emotions. And secondly, that Buddhist poetry has a distinctive characteristic, uh, um, characteristic with the, which they put into the metaphor of, of a sense. So we have Buddhist poetry as having scent of vegetable, uh, scent of mold throbs, and scent of bamboo shoots, and so on. So-called aristocratic culture of Japan, on the other hand, was greatly relying on Buddhism and non-differentiated Chinese culture in general. And examples of this phenomenon could be dimensioned already um, Gozan Bungaku or numerous Japanese painters and other forms of arts. It seems that Hanson, Suda and Fangan were literary figures, a kind of container of poetic identities for Buddhist poets created poems anonymously during the Tang dynasty. There may be many reasons why these alleged Hanson authors wrote poems anonymously, though one of the most likely hypotheses, in my opinion, seems to be the fear of breaking the rules set up for committed practitioner of Chan Buddhism, fear of the metaphorical demon of poetry. Such a fear was common at that time. Poetry was not widely recognized as one of the paths to enlightenment. But this discourse was divided over this highly controversial issue, and it was precisely this controversy that anonymous authors of Han Shan Shi uh, may have wanted to avoid. If the authors of the poems composed them under the pseudonym of Han Shan, Shu and Fongan, they would not have to take responsibility for them, and at the same time, they would not have to limit them themselves with their poetic endeavors. For this reason, the popularity of non-canonical motifs in Hansons could be due to a kind of survivorship bias, the error of uh, formulating a thesis without considering the reasons that make the dat data unrepresentative in a broader sample. If Hansons was to be this reservoir of so-called cursed um, anonymous monks' works, it should come as no surprise that it contains a noticeable amount of such motives. After all, this would be the reason for the creation of the Cold Mountain Poems corpus. Hanshan Shui is a fairly typical example of Buddhist poetry of its time, a litmus paper of the historical changes taking place during the Tang Dynasty. It is an element in the process of a gradual software shift of Buddhism away from urban places to isolated mountains, mountainous uh, solitudes. 
there, Buddhism um, acquired, acquired many features in common, in, in common with Taoism. Also typical is its uh, disagreement with the Co Confucian social order of the time, its opposition to the Tang establishment and its promotion of withdrawal from a volatile social life divided by many rebellions and persecutions. From a literary point of view, it can be said that Han Shan Shi is an example of avant-garde Buddhist Shi, an example of Shiification of Buddhist poetry. On the one hand, it is a work committed to literary creativity, but on the other hand, it is also committed to the theme of Buddhist spirituality, at least to some extent. Um, regardless of the exact dating of Cold Mountain poetry, it was created even um, earlier than known examples of uh, this type of literature, which appeared during the Song Dynasty. This also applies to the reception of Han Shansu in Japan. The warmer reception of the poems from the Cold Mountain in Japan uh, than in China may have been due to two factors. Firstly, Buddhism in China was part of the imperial establishment only Episodically, while in Japan, at various times, different layers of the elites supported Buddhism, and this was not only limited to some periods in history. Secondly, in Japan, it was not usual to view lyricism and Buddhism as two incompatible things, which was the case in China. Thus, it can be said that Han Sanso is also something of a litmus paper in the Japanese world. Last but not least, Buddhism in Han Shansu is obviously a highly important theme, but this poetry should not be diminished to just Buddhist poetry, since it was actively engaged in non-Buddhist literary discourse. There's a need of a new paradigm closer towards a more considerate interpretation of Buddhistness and secularness. Paul Roser proposed so-called Buddhist reading of Han Shansu in response to that Based on the commentary of Hakuin Ekaku, I would propose uh, sinological reading. This type of interpretations, uh, interpretation seems to be the most relevant approach to Han Shan Su. Moreover, it also points to the broader, often occurring problem of erroneous separation of Buddhism from other Chinese religious traditions, while the two have been shaping each other over, over the centuries. Timothy Barrett assessed the influence of this poetry of the entire school, writing that it was not Hanshan who followed Chan, but it was Chan that followed Hanshan. And in a similar spirit, I would argue for the par paradigm of synologization of the approach to Hanshan Su and Chinese poet Buddhist poetry in general, which, in my opinion, is a valuable analytical approach that can serve to develop new insights into these phenomena. Thank you very much.